So interpreting stratigraphic columns uh, is one of the key aspects of being a stratigrapher and using the sedimentology to interpret ancient depositional environments. So we're going to take uh, this stratigraphic column uh, here, uh, which is uh, actually Cambrian in age, and we're going to use the sedimentary structures preserved in that stratigraphic column to interpret the depositional environments. So I've written out this uh, page that describes how to do that, and it includes, as a first step, uh, characterizing the diagnostic sedimentary structures, then developing a tentative environmental interpretation, check that interpretation with respect to consistency with other features, and then we will in detail evaluate the vertical uh, facies changes and apply Walther's law to test whether our environmental interpretation is consistent. Okay, so we'll go step by step uh, through this process. So the first thing is to identify diagnostic sedimentary structures. And we have this legend here, and the ones that are um, pretty consistent with uh, specific depositional environments are hummocky cross stratification, which suggests storms, and particularly storms in standing water that have the waves um, plus currents. Um, Swaley cross stratification is a version of hummocky cross stratification, but there's more erosion on the tops of it, so both of these represent storms. And then tabular to wedge cross stratification um, is uh, typical of tides. The key thing to note in the legend here is that you have lamina dipping in two different directions, um, not always, but sometimes, which is consistent with the herringbone cross stratification. And in this particular case, it represents uh, tidal influences. Okay. So the first thing, we have these two sets of diagnostic textures. Um, trough cross stratification can occur in a lot of environments, so it's not specific to an environment. Shale occurs whenever the sediment, the, the water flow speed is low. Pebbles require a high flow speed. Burrows are from organisms that have time to burrow. And intraclass suggests erosion within the environment um, and deposition of the, for example, consolidated mud or slightly cemented sandstone. So none of the other ones are particularly diagnostic, but these storm deposits and the tidal influences are. So when if we look over at this, this, uh, the strat column here, uh, we have the hummocky cross stratification sort of throughout this area. So we can say that the, the strat column is influenced by storms in standing water here. Uh, storms here. All right. There's interclasts and this little wiggly line represents erosion so there's a lot of uh, high flow speed, draw that U for flow speed. Then we have our storms again here, and uh, this is the Swaley cross stratification, so we have storms. Um, the trough cross stratification can be a number of different sorts of environments. Um, we have a high flow speed again here and storms. Uh, again we have the trough cross stratification which is a little bit um, uncertain what it is. Then we have a high flow speed again um, at this unconformity. And then up here we have evidence of tides with the flow going back and forth in multiple directions.
And then up here, it's not 100% clear what the sedimentary structures are. There are a lot of interclasts, and those when they're filled in black, it means that they're mud. So we have, but then if we look at our grain size down here, we have uh, medium sand. So these, these are sand, and the P is for pebble. So I am interpreting this as being mudstone, otherwise known as uh, shale, but mud deposited and class of mud here, but of course um, grain size. So I'm going to also interpret this as possibly related to tides because uh, Tidal environments often have a range of flow speeds which can produce, the, which can allow the settling of mud from suspension, uh, as well as the transport of coarse grain sizes. So the transport of grains is when, of coarse grains is when the tidal flows are very high and the mud settles out when it's low. And then we have um, an unconformity here. So a high flow speed again here. Okay. So if I use these uh, distinctive sedimentary structures and we can look at the change in grain size, my overall interpretation, tentative interpretation, is that uh, the flow speed increases upward. And the storms are in standing water, so this would be a lake or ocean based on the storm deposits. Um, but up here we have tides, and so we know that this needs to be in the ocean because very few lakes actually have tides. So I'm going to cross out the possible lake interpretation for the storms because the tides indicate we have an oceanic environment here. Okay. So I have a tentative interpretation that we have something that's offshore uh, and storm influenced and then we go up into a tidal zone. There are a number of layers, like for example in here, that I don't have an interpretation for yet. So my step one was to identify these features. My step two was a tentative interpretation. Now I'm going to move into step three, which is looking for consistency with the other features. Okay, so I cleaned up uh, the uh, image a little bit. And we are at step three, looking for consistency with other features. Okay, so if you start at the bottom, uh, it's very fine sand down here, so and storm deposits. So this is probably a pretty deep water environment. And then we have this unconformity. So I ask myself, is an unconformity consist and intraclass above it, is that consistent with uh, storm deposits? And I will say that maybe there's a particularly large uh, set of storms and it's very common for them to uh, cause erosion surfaces and have class at the bottom of them at the peak of the storm. So I will say that basically this is consistent uh, with the storm environment. Right. Um, it will have, it represents a higher energy or higher flow speed uh, to get these environments and often the higher flow speed is closer to shore. So I'm going to I'm going to have a tentative refinement of my interpretation as possibly closer 
to shore. So then we have storms again um, in this environment. And I should mention we should evaluate the bioturbation. And uh, the bioturbation is common in this environment. Okay. So, so far everything's consistent. Um, we have our storm deposits and, and a bioturbation again. And here we have this Swaley cross stratification. This is also from storms. Uh, but uh, uh, again, a uh, higher flow. And so that is also consistent with closer to shore. We'll keep that as a tentative interpretation. So if we look at our column, it's generally getting higher energy, and we have these two indications that maybe we're getting closer to shoreline. Okay, so now we get to this trough cross stratified uh, sand here, and this requires uh, the grain size is uh, fine to medium sand, so it's a higher flow speed than down below, and it has more unidirectional flow. So we're, we have a tentative interpretation that we're getting closer to sh shoreline with a higher energy. And then we have the question, could this be related to being closer to shore? And um, the cross, trough cross stratification can form from a current, but often irregular currents. And so one of the currents that can form near shore would be for a uh, rip current, for example, that's flowing offshore. And um, so this is consistent uh, with a near shore, either a rip current or possibly in a river channel, but it's consistent with a near shore environment. So this sequence suggests it's shallowing upward. Now we have an unconformity here, erosion. And we're returning to storm deposits again. Okay. So these storm deposits are again finer grained. And so this suggests uh, deeper, possibly deeper water again. Okay. Um, we know we have to be uh, below sea level to get the storm deposits because they require that standing water for the waves and the currents. Okay. Then we go back up into the same trough cross stratified facies. So we can again say, okay, is, is that consistent with our interpretation down here, or is there some additional information? There's a little bit of additional information right here in this black part, which again is mud, which requires a low flow speed to accumulate. Okay. So now we have this possible mud. We again have some bioturbation and we have this, this coarser sand um, in these sorts of deposits. So the presence of the mud here and the sand suggests that we have variable environments. The mud might just be right at the bottom here which um, uh, suggests that maybe it's some sort of transitional environment. So I have a question here. 
is the mud if from a separate environment. So that's something I'm going to want to test when we um, uh, really work with Walther's Law. And then we're getting up here, tides uh, in the ocean uh, with moderately high flow speeds in different parts here. So, and then we have an unconformity with pebbles and um, uh, faster flow in this zone here. Okay. So this is all consistent, this environment up here, all the features are consistent with what you would see on tidal flats. and in subtidal environments. So tidal flats that often have the channels, tidal channels in them. Um, uh, it's very common to get these, uh, this, this suite of depositional textures. Okay, so in my evaluation, I haven't found anything that's inconsistent with uh, a tentative model where, or the hypothetical model, where we have standing water with storms. We have some indication we're getting to shallow environments um, in these trough, two trough cross stratified intervals, and I'm not sure yet how they exactly fit in with these storm deposits. Um, and then there's this tidal flat zone up here. So we did the consistency with other features combined with a vertical evaluation. And the next step then is to compare that vertical evaluation and uh, Walther's Law. Okay, so we have our tentative interpretation. And now uh, we want to evaluate it with respect to Walther's Law. So we have an offshore environment. Uh, as a hypothesis with a couple of shallower or higher energy. Uh, this trough cross stratification near shore, back to offshore, back to near shore, and then shallow marine tidal environments. So, so how do we test that? So the first thing we can do is if you have, uh, there are two ways to approach this one of which is to draw the environments that you have in your mind and see if you can trace those through the strat column on the environment or you can go vertically through the column and try to and draw the environment. So I have a pretty good um, mental image of um, what I think the shoreline might look like and so I'm going to uh, draw, try to draw that. So I'm going to draw a map view. All right. And so this is land up here. And we have our shoreline somewhere in here. And we have our ocean down here. So we have offshore storm deposits. So I'm going to say that this is uh, below uh, wave base, normal wave base, but um, above storm wave base. Okay. And then maybe this little bit that's shallower uh, will be a little bit closer to the shoreline. Um, and then we have something going on in the shoreline that produces this trough cross stratification. So one of the ways that can happen is if you have a current flowing offshore. So I'm going to say maybe we have some sort of uh, river flowing in into the zone here. And this is where we're getting our uh, trough cross stratification. So I can draw it something like this. Right. And then we have uh, some tidal flats 
over here. So I'm going to draw a set of uh, channels. in here for my title channels and maybe sometimes the flow moves upstream here and then I'll mark maybe an area with um, this will be the the high tide line and the solid one will be low tide. Okay, so this is this is sort of a hypothesis that's um, based on you know looking at some of the Google Earth images and so let's test to see how uh, this fits with our, um, our model and our environments. Okay, so if Walther's law is correct, we should be able to move gradationally from one environment to the next um, without skipping any unless there's an unconformity. So we'll start with our offshore storms. And so I should add that so this is this line here would be storm wave base. So we're seeing the effects of storm in all of this. So we'll start out somewhere out here. Okay, my hypothesis is that this is uh, somewhat uh, shallower, but still basically the same environment. So maybe that's something in here. So we can go from one to two to sh for shallower. Uh, and then maybe it comes back to deeper water as we're getting more of these storms and then we think that it's shallower again. Okay. So this would be three and four. Okay. And then we need to see if we can get to something that will have the trough cross stratification and I think I it added this river so that we could get that here. So we can sort of go into this environment here. Um, maybe it sort of goes up more strongly influenced by the river, maybe not. It'd be something uh, to test. And then we go back to an environment where we have the unconformity and the interclass, which is a lot like environment two. So maybe we're going back here. There is some erosion right here. So we could be missing an environment, but we can actually go back to uh, this environment. Um, so this would be five. This would be six. We can go back to that environment without a big change. So, so far everything's consistent. Then we need to go back to the near shore environment again. So this would be seven. Um, and so we can go back in here. And then we would be sort of um, have the coarser grain, some erosion into the tidal flat environment. And I haven't sorted these out in detail, uh, but um, the uh, uh, style of stratification here in the coarse grain size might actually be within a channel. So just based on the grain size, I'm going to guess that 8 is sort of within a channel here with mud clasts. Um, the herringbone uh, cross stratification with a little bit of mud in here might be pretty close to a channel. 
in here where there's a lot of flow in and out, but it's it's inundated with um, at high tide. And then we go up into this zone here, and I'm not sure what this cross stratification means, but we'll say this is sort of nine and ten. Ten could maybe sort of be anywhere in here. And then we have a, a bigger erosion zone, which might be related to the channel here. But we sort of have tidal flats on either side. But it represents to get the, the pebbles, we need a faster flow speed, which maybe our river can um, produce here. Okay. So in evaluating my Walther's Law, I can sort of go continuously, messily, among these environments. So we can basically say that the interpretation Uh, of the environments is consistent uh, with Walther's Law. Okay. So the final thing we can do is check for consistency uh, or check and interpret what happened with sea level. So what is the overall uh, change through time? So in this zone here, we went maybe shallower, a little deeper. So we can say, so if we um, plotted up sea level, we can do it on this side of the column. So we can do uh, low. High relative sea level. Um, the sea, the water depth is high initially, so the sea level, relative sea level, would be high. We think maybe it gets a little bit shallower, a little deeper, shallower, and then in this channel, we don't. Uh, we think we're pretty close to um, the shoreline. And then to get the hummocky, we probably go deep pretty quickly, which represents this, this line over here. Right? So that uh, represents this change right here. And then we go shallower again. And then this zone is probably intertidal. So this we don't know in detail how it's changing, but the zone in here represents deposits probably that are somewhere between high and low tide. So this would be within uh, the tide change. So based on these facies changes and tracking them back and forth across the map, we can match and track the relative sea level change in this um, column. Okay. So just to review the processes we took, step one was to identify uh, the diagnostic sedimentary structures. And in particular, we found hummocky cross stratification and herringbone cross stratification and um, likely mud drapes. We use those, the evidence of storms and tides, to develop a tentative environmental interpretation, which was offshore to near shore. We checked the consistency of other features, especially the trough cross stratification um, being one of those. Um. Then we evaluated, we did steps three and four about the same time. We looked for consistency with a vertical evaluation. Then we used that vertical evaluation to create an environment um, and a map of different 
areas where the deposits would be made to test that hypothesis using Walther's law. Okay. So this is a process that we do when we are uh, measuring stratigraphic columns in the field. We uh, develop these hypotheses and we look to see if we can make additional observations to test them. And we can also use it to uh, interpret other people's stratigraphic columns like we did here.